you here again, both metaphorically and allegorically and literally. Uh, I'm back in the Matrix shop again after a very long break. I haven't been well over Christmas. I haven't really spoke about it, but I have. I had an injury that uh, has left me in a lot of pain. But I'll be okay. Uh, it's not anything serious. It's just going to take time to heal. And uh, so I have to take it easy. It happens, life, and that's just how it is. So, um, I hope you're all keeping well. I hope uh, life is being good to you. The weather's quite nice here. It's freshening up nicely. And um, things are strange, all right. You know, it's like, it seemed to be that I could, un I could figure out what was going on, you know, prior to, say, now, like just before Christmas, around Christmas, last Christmas, a month or so ago. And since 2024 has started, it feels very, I don't know what the word would be, it would be, it's mis mysterious almost. It's like difficult to figure anything out. There's no, yeah, we have like a reinforcement of cliches uh, by, you know, the powers that be, psychopathic control grid. And... Um, other than that, I look around online and in terms of like psychic weather, and well, but uh, that reminds me the Hocus Focus is on Sarah Mondaini's channel, a brand new, it's going, to be going out every month now because of like the work that Sarah puts into it. It's, it's basically, she's basically taken over the show now. I've like given her charge of that basically on her channel and I'm still on the show and things like that, but I just don't have time and... I haven't, you know, as like I said, I'm dealing with a, I'm dealing with a lot of pain at the moment that needs to be fixed, and um, a lot of things going on, and so you know, I'm back at the regular job. I was very busy at that right before Christmas, and I think that's probably, how, I guess, how I hurt myself, and um, so that's on tomorrow. I don't forget that on eight o'clock on her channel, and uh, this is my mate Michael over there, and. Uh, I'll, I'm taking it easy at the moment. I'm just I want to get better and stuff like that. I'm doing a lot of things. I just finished up a book on the Ren La Chateau mysteries with Neil MacDonald. And that she's just done an interview with Gary Vasey on that. And that will be out in the next couple of weeks. And that's that's a big one. That's going to blow that whole Ren La Chateau thing out of the water. It's nothing to do with the traditional narrative surrounding the whole Holy Blood, Holy Grail thing. Uh, that could well be true. I, that's we're, that's irrelevant to us. We're on a different tangent altogether, and uh, the, the provisional title, or I think the title will be, you know, uh, Sonia the Priest Wizard of Shren Le Chateau. So that's a clue into what it's about. You know, I it brought my occult knowledge into it very deeply, and Neil brought his knowledge of the Shren Le Chateau mystery into that. So. I think we've cracked a, a big secret on this one. I think it's going to like really blow up. So look out for that book. And uh, and we have Hocus Focus. And I'm still going to try and get more documentaries done on Beyond Room 313. And I want to do some more interviews and stuff like that with other people. Uh, on my channel, <laughs> I've been turning down a lot of interviews with other people lately. I just haven't been in the mood for it. I don't want to be the same, one of these people who say the same things over and over again. You get a lot of that, you know, like there's people have been repeating the same thing for 10 years on alt media. I don't want to be ever be one of those people. I'll leave before then. And uh, so that, you know, but uh, I'm generally, you know, for all my adult life or since I was 11, I've been going at 11. And now I'm definitely, it's catching up with me. And you can't be going at 11 for the rest of your life. You know, it's now time. I don't, I'm not going to retire. I'll never retire. You know, I'll be here. I'll be here doing these vlogs, and I'm hope, hopefully a hundred. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that'll be that. That would be funny. And that'd be funny going uh, getting the Alzheimer's on here, wouldn't it? You know, yeah. You know, I remember the Great Reset. It was, it was, it was a horse that ran in the Grand National. You know, <laughs> just stay tuned. You'll get it eventually. But, uh, yeah, so uh, there'll always be things to talk about. But at the moment, you know, it's a strange, 
it, it, the world is in a kind of state of limbo, I find, at the moment. Everything seems to be in a state of limbo. And I was just thinking, like, the powers, the, you know, the, the psychopathic control grid, the Western civilization destroyers, in a state of free fall. You know, you know when people are in an orbital space station like Mir or the ISS or, or Skylab before it fell out of the sky, and, and, and even in, you know, orbital spaceships, they're not... not that their their sense of g of lack of g force is actually caused by velocity heading they're crashing into the earth, but they're crashing into the earth at a very slight angle, and that's what causes weightlessness. It's not weightlessness, you know, caused by space. It's actually caused by lift and the, the force impacting upon that is gravity. So if you were out in if you were that's why in in space stations they have to tape their things down on the table. You know, like they, they're having fruit or food, they have to tape it onto a double-sided tape on the table. Otherwise, it would lift like they do because it's uh, the velocity of coming in, the, uh, the, free, the free fall. And if they were in outer space away from the Earth's gravity, it would just stay on the table. It wouldn't lift up until someone flicked it and then it would, then it would take off. So that's why the stuff lifts on, on space stations. And if you're out in deep space, it doesn't lift. You have to pick, push it up. Because uh, you know, there's no there's no velocity uh, force of gravity pushing against it from the free fall of the velocity the slow narrow angle free fall very interesting stuff when you really get into it but um, that's why satellites are are all doomed to crash into Earth eventually that's it's really a long spiral that's why Skylab came down remember that song dog that film Dogs in Space uh, with uh, poor Michael Hutchins. But yeah, it go it go. It's so eventually, it, like space stations like Mir and and the others can make, and, and lots of them have rockets in them, or ways to actually adjust their uh, their their angle of attack, so they don't actually they can stay in orbit for longer. They can just move up a little bit. But uh, that's what that metaphor of you know free fall gravity in orbit is. How it seems to be with the globalists right now. They seem very unsure of themselves. There's lots of, there's lots of, and, and also like, you know, the, the, or like the Western civilizations, the destroyers, who I would include the left and the liberals at the moment, they've lost a sense of, even though they have total and absolute ownership of the mass media, they have this ability, this, this, they, they don't seem to have that cockiness and self assuredness that was born out of um, arrogance, really, and having the power, having basically owning the media, having that kind of arrogance from owning the media and um, they're in that state they're in a kind of a free fall state but they're maintaining orbital orbital trajectory and you can see you, the certain things make you realize the fruit is rising they've sort of given up on that trump the well the Ireland they haven't because well the irish it's just like that whole bambi thug thing the irish you know mainstream are at least 50 years behind the mainstream and the rest of the world because they're not cool or hick, they're they're out of touch. They're unsophisticates. They think they're sophisticates, but they're not. They're they you know, while the sort of like the establishment of say other other countries are involved in sort of you know galleries and you know like opening of galleries and cutting edge art and this kind of thing. The Irish ones are really basically on Love Island. They're that level, you know. They're that level, you know. If you were to compare the Irish establishment. They're sophisticated in terms of sophistication. Uh, they would be, uh, you know, they would be the lamos, uh, you know, way behind the time. But they have that, you know, they're 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 totally uh, they're totally not cooler. And but the funny thing is, back in the eighties, when we were supposed to be this this like awful society, the Irish were on the cutting edge of all that stuff. It's it's like I always said, you know, when when Ireland was broke and a backwater we produced the virgin prunes then when we got rich and you know trendy we produced westlife boy bands and i think that's always how it's been and we're still they're still producing boy bands and we it's like we went from sort of like you know samuel beckett ireland to louis walsh ireland that's why. So with the Irish establishment now are completely, completely unsophisticated, completely, you know, lamos, 
uh, they're basically Love Island, you know, basically that's it. But they think that that's why when something like Bambi Thug comes along, they, they use words like cutting edge, breaking barriers, demolishing stereotypes. When the people like the Virgin Prunes and bands like that and the Atrix and all that kind of like uh, Stano was another guy back then. And there was all kinds of other outside, I don't say outsider, I wouldn't say like, like conceptual artists and avant-garde people in Ireland in the late 70s, early 80s who were doing this stuff way out beyond what, you know, that even back then when it was groundbreaking, when it was. I wrote an article on my Substack about it, you know, Bambi Thug when you order the Virgin Prunes from Wish. And that's what they're like. They're basically, that's what the Irish establishment are like. They're a wish, a wish society. So who are the avant-garde in Ireland? Well, they're people like me. They're people in the alternative media. That, that's who they are now. And uh, we, are the, we are the true avant-garde. And, uh, and uh, you know, that's how I see myself. I've always seen myself as being an outsider. And uh, I'm very comfortable being, you know, that song by Suzanne Vega, Vega left of centre, not politically, but, you know, on the outside of the fringes, left of centre, out of the way. That, that, I love Suzanne Vega, but I love, that, I love the lyrics in that song. If you ask me what I'm looking at, I always answer, nothing much, but she was, she was brilliant. Anyway, um, we don't, ha you know, the, the Irish establishment don't have that. They're lamos. And they're, you know, that echoes to the whole political stuff. But you see it everywhere. You see, like, you know, in England, it's gone like that. There's no cool left except us freaks. You know, you know, us freaks. You know, we're, we're the only thing that could be considered avant-garde now. And uh, the whole mainstream media has become, you know, it's become boring. It's become sameness. It's become pointless. It's, it's, the world is in free fall. The world is in free fall, and the only thing to make you realise that it's in free fall is when the when things that were should be stuck down on the table start rising because of the trajectory of gravity impacting upon the free fall, and then you notice that hey, there's something funny going on here. They they definitely seem a bit lost. These the powers that be, not just in Ireland but everywhere. There's a lot of backtracking. It's like the Trump derangement syndrome is definitely gone. They've kind of come to the realization it's like a marriage ending. Or a relationship ending, it's like, ah, it's over, that's the end of that. Or, you know, you're fed up with a business and so you want to walk away from a job. That's, that seems to be what they're like with that stuff at the moment. A lot of that going on. The last Davos thing didn't seem like a very happy affair. It looked creepy, and I think even they felt creepy doing it. And the whole thing was a re-establishing trust. They don't understand that they never had anyone's trust to begin with. <laughs> you re-establish trust when you have someone's trust to begin with. They never even had the trust to begin with. And, um... I cannot really tell what's going to happen in 2024 i just can't really it's you know you even look at the ukraine thing they're basically giving Zelensky the cold shoulder except for biden and he's only doing that out of spite and uh you know we were ruled by lunatics we're absolute and uh, but more than lunatics were ruled by kind of like M npcs really you know people that don't have any depth of personality there's no sort of sense of self but there's no sort of deeper sense of self there's nothing like that you don't get that kind of deeper sense of self with these people that they sit down and have a, a moment of self-realization. They're all everything is cliches and buzzwords, and it's funny. We're living in an age that's probably been more metaphor and allegory laden than ever. You know, more metaphor, allegory, and symbolist symbolism and symbolist laden than ever, and yet most people don't get what metaphors and allegory and symbolism are these days. They can't grasp it in this sort of like social media, digital age. They can't get, they can't get the concept of an allegory, a metaphor. I, I see that a lot now, you know, where, you know, our grandparents lived in, especially here in Ireland, lived in a world of metaphors and allegory, lived in them. You know, I can remember, like, if you were to go, if you, listen to my, if you were to go back to, say, Dublin in the 1950s and listen to people talking, you wouldn't understand what they were saying, you know, they would all be talking in allegories and metaphor. And it's become this sort of artistic society, As I shouldn't put that, like I'm not putting down artistic people, you know, that Asperger's, I'm not putting them down either, but it's become like that, in that kind of like, everything has to be literal and direct. And there's no sense of allegory, you know. There's, and, and this is, this is usually the end of a civilization and the beginning of a new one. You know, I always talk about 
the the end of the, the the pagan Roman Empire and the end of the classical world, you had you had symbolic things like the manes or this manibus or the manibus, the the sort of relationship with the ancestral spirits became a literal debt cult when we were in Roman sort of like you know respectable society to the point when from when they went from honoring the ancestors as ancestral spirits and on towards literally honor literally worshiping the dead so it went from uh, so they went from a sort of like you know we're surrounded by our answer the spirits of our ancestors it went from that among the establishment the never the peasants of course never lost them and then down into literally going to their graves and spend you know that's the end of a civilization because it's returning to, it's it's symbolically burying itself and at the same time too you will have the iconoclast so at the same time you have sort of like you see this is why scientology the scientology of 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 classical of ancient rome was christianity it began with the as as a fad among the elites who had you know i was remember reading about the manson family years ago and the you know all the hollywood hip parties would have these groovy freaks you know that's how they all knew sharon tate and everybody that's how they were able to gain access to their houses and kill them uh, because they were the freaks man you know like you know some hollywood director going i'm having a party tonight you know jane fonda's going to be there and there you know Michael Caine and Charlton Heston. We're going to bring some freaks over, freaks over from this, you know, from from the ranch, you know. And then that was Spanson and his people. Well, that's what happened in ancient Rome with Christianity. They were going, you know, uh, uh, Claudius Maximus. Uh, we're having a, we're going to have a, uh, a bacchanalia tonight, and uh, to, uh, we've invited over these people called Christians. Oh, they're rather interesting. You, you went and you see them. They they dress all in black. They never smile. Um, they follow this dead rabbi called Yeshua, uh, who was apparently uh, sacrificed. He's their god, and uh, they're the freaks. You know, no, that, that's what they were. That's that, and that's how they. That's how Christianity infiltrated the, the Western world through the upper classes. Christianity was the Scientology of the classical era, and uh, so we're ha now. What's the Scientology of the ones today? Well, the climate stuff. You know, so. You know, the archetypes always come back. So at the beginning of, at the end of the Roman classical empire, the you know, which even in Ireland, the Western world, even in America, Australia, even you're, you're subject to this. This is your heritage. Canada and so on. The, uh, as the empire the clap, the collapsed, they brought in freaks from the fringe. The freaks from the fringes were incorporated in as, as sort of like oddities for the, you know, the, the high poli to sort of like uh, have as fashion accessories, accessories. Well, now the fashion accessories are trannies and transgenders. You know, um, my, my 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 son Quentin is now a, a, a is now a woman called Claudia. You know this kind of thing, and that's you know. And then the middle class take that over. So you have like uh, these Munchausen mothers, you know, who like burlesque their own sons you know like the kid is she sees the kid one day looking at us uh, picking up his, his sister cindy doll and the next thing she's having him castrate and putting him on hormone blockers and then boasting about it on social media about a non-binary child well that's how it happens now uh, what defines the christ the moment that's the, the biggest part of the movement from from classical paganism to christianity the icon iconoclasm so you know they, they really like in, it's really defined in you know terminal moments you know you always have terminal moments in history 9 11 pearl harbor you know um the battle of uh, the boyne 1690 the battle of hastings uh the the you know napoleon's retreat from russia waterloo you know there's always this terminal moments where the old world is all or the previous paradigm is gone and the new one begins and it often has iconoclasts like so iconoclasts are not necessarily people to tr destroy icons but literally in metaphor we're back to that again so you had like the collapse of the the bourbon royalist france and what the, the iconoclasts were the aristocrats and the catholics they beheaded you know this kind of thing and so our, you know, when Christianity took over, the iconoclasts were literal then. They were attacking statues. And Catherine Nixby, Nixie's, 
um, the Darkening Age, she uses the allegory of the Temple of Palmyra in Syria, that, which is a Temple of Athena, which is the great centre of pagan classical learning, uh, a kind of a university where the Christians came out, that the hammers of Christ came out of the desert and smashed the statue of Athena. The statue of Athena was th then blown up in 2014 by the Taliban. So, you know, the Abrahamic initial iconoclast and then the secondary one through, uh, through Jesus. So crusade, well, it wasn't crusade then, it was, you know, it was evangelicalism. So, you know, the, the evangelicals, evangelical Christians, Jews, Second Temple Rabbi, you know, Jews, they they snatch mash off Athena's nose. Taliban come along fourteen hundred years later, fifteen hundred years later, and blow blow up the thing completely. So you know they, it always repeats. And so, what do we have now? Well, well, all those posh kids throwing the and they're posh kids, the establishment throwing cans of soup at the Mona Lisa and the Night Watch and any kind of like beautiful painting of Western civilization there, that they're the iconoclast. And it's like, we're protesting, just stop oil, you know, just these types, you know. And um, so they're, they're, we're back to them. The iconoclasts are back. This time they're fanatical religious, fanat they're, they're religious fanatics for, um, and they're not even like pagans, not Gaia. They're just, they're just, they're just, they've, another, they've a fetish for stopping oil and a fetish for th things that don't work, you know, like wind turbines and electric cars. They're just not happening, you know, and uh, you knew, and so you, you get those cyclical cyclical events, these archetypes repeating. Now I can ha I can have this conversation to you guys because I love you all and you're intelligent and that's why you're here and you're str and even if you're not, you know, very well read or anything, you've got you're on that knowledge quest. You're trying to find answers. You, I could never walk up to one of them and say, well, you know, you're basically the resurgent archetype of the iconoclasts at the end of the plague in world. And they would go, what? Huh? They wouldn't know. They wouldn't even know how you were doing that. They're, they don't have that sense of self-reference. It's pretty mad. Uh, and you all, you know, so like... You look at the whole, one of the reasons I'm interested in this whole resurgence of UFO things is Jungian and also spiritual. Uh, you will also see at the points in the crossroads, a terminal moment or a crossroads, um, like Carl Jung says, they will, people will see beings of light in the sky. You know, at the so beginning of Christianity, when you had all this turmoil going on, people were seeing angels or crosses burning. Well, you know, the, you know, the Melvin Bridge, oh, well, that never happened, that was a made up story. But, um, you know, t t the pyro symbol in the sky, that's what they saw. Uh, you know, the, the, the phantoms are cast up into the, into the heavens in order for people to be spellbound with as the world is collapsing on the bottom. And you get the reverse archetypes that when you're, everything is going well in your life and things are fine and you're playing the game, it starts to brittle, become brittle at the edge. That's when you don't see lights in the sky you see the sea monsters rising from the depths. You know that song by the police synchronicity too? You know, you know, the, he constantly draws the allegory between this guy working, this sort of middle English management guy with a, you know, fake suicidal wife and annoying kids and sexually frustrated and the, you know, secretary's pout and preen like cheap tarts in a red light street, but all he ever thinks to do is watch. And when that's going on, you know, and every single meeting with a so called thing of genius, so called superior, is a humiliating kick in the crotch. And then many miles away, something crawls to the surface of a dark Scottish loch. So he uses the allegory of the of the sea monster, the lake monster, arising to the surface as this guy's life of conformity is falling apart. So when you're living your best life and it's not enough the monsters rise from the depths when you're falling apart and seeking answers the phantoms of light appear in the sky now they could be actually spiritual thing beings as well in fact i think they are that they're not just think projections of the subconscious minds i think they're actually like tulpas or egregores and the same thing too now if you're in balance with nature what do you see fairies and little people Satyrs, fawns, nymphs. You see them in the landscape around you. 
And that's why our ancestors who lived in the Sylvian, I won't say Arcadian because the concept of Arcadia, like in the Poussin painting, A to Arcadia, go the shepherds to the Bergingers of Arcadia. The shepherds, oh God, you get it on here, don't you? The the shepherds of Arcadia. Uh, the shepherd is pointing A to Arcadia, E to Arcadia, or go, meaning into Arcadia we go. Now that's a, that's a very symbolic painting, which you will learn all about, the true meaning of. And I've been to that location in the south of France not too long ago, and it, it was a special experience. And... Um, Acadia is unattainable. Uh, you know, it's idyllic life on earth, but it's unattainable. It's unattainable. So, but when you're in balance on earth, you don't see sea monsters in the depth and you don't see angels in the sky or lights in the sky. You become aware of the nature spirits in the woods and fields and lands around you. And that's why our agrarian ancestors who lived on the land, worked the land, saw the fairies and saw the fawns, saw the the Sathers, they didn't see lights in the sky or monsters in the deep, only when things went wrong, either in the material world when it went wrong on the surface, sea monsters, or when it was in a state of confusion, lights in the sky. There you go. That's basically synchronicity and Jungian symbolism and projection and catalytic stereotization phenomena. And uh, I could sit there talking with this for hours, but I'd probably bore the tits off his. Now, um, so anyway, so that's the state we're in now. Lights in the sky, strange objects in the sky. You know, that's because we're in a state of free fall because we're at the crossroads of a terminal moment. We don't know what's happening in the future. And that's why the symbol of the crossroads is so central to folklore and culture. That's why statues of Hecate uh, appears at crossroads all over the Catholic world. Now she's become the Virgin Mary. She represents all those things what it you know it, when you reach the crossroads what you're what you're being forced to do is react as an individual so you're following the road along right and you you know you know what you're to do you're following that and then you hit a crossroads do i go continue on or go left or right now that's that's why hecate appears at the corner of the crossroads or, and then later christians later on called it the devil because the devil is saying to Robert Johnson in the song Cross, have you heard that song? Have you ever heard the original recording of um, Crossroads by Robert Johnson's Johnson? I see. I don't like blues based rock, but I do like the old pure, like Delta blues and like the old pure, like African American blues. But I, most people hear, you know, Crossroads from people like Rand, you know, Pat Travers or you know, Eric Clapton or. Not putting these people down, you know, or Stevie Ray Vaughan, you know, going down to the crossroads, you know, they're doing a kind of a rock style. Have you ever listened to the, the original Robert Johnson version of it? It's spooky. Go down to the crossroads. But he, I can't even do his voice. It's, his voice is unearthly. It's other, it's otherworldly. What I, I didn't hear until I was in my 20s. And I said, that's the original recording of Crossroads? I was like, really? This Robert Johnson's voice was very peculiar. And then there's the whole legend that he made a deal with the devil. No, he didn't. He was a sojourn black male who came to the crossroads and decided that he was not going to be a sojourn black male living that life. And that's what Hecate means at the crossroads, the statue in ancient Rome. And that's why I filled it into the Celtic world. And so on the crossroads is a terminal moment where you make a decision and we're at the crossroads but some people can't progress on so they're looking at the statue of the virgin mary and going oh jesus the holy mother and mary give us light give us guidance you know this kind of thing where hecate, hecate the in pagan times said i represent i'm the goddess of all possibilities make your own choice motherfucker and deal with it sanguine gnosis take care of yourselves love yourself and be safe and be kind and be uh, just be just just be fucking cool.